Okay, I want to tell you about the last day Eddie went up the tower. Eddie used to sit by the entrance. That was his place. He would sit by and he would open it up. It'd be open all day. And in his final days when his legs were uh, pretty wrecked and he couldn't really walk very well on them, he would bring his walker. And he'd sit, the walker had a seat and he'd sit on the walker and he'd hang out. And I came in the garden one day and I said, oh, hey, hey, we always talk. And I went and did my thing somewhere else. And about 20 minutes later, I turn around and he's not... And yeah, his walker at the front, he's, he's not there. So I'm like, okay. And then I see movement on the tower. And I have found, see, Eddie is halfway up the tower, and he has managed to figure out a pulley system, like throwing rope over beams, and that's like the simplest pulley you can imagine. Yeah. And he was tying his legs up wow. and using the pulley to pull his legs up, and then he'd stick them in the a wedge in the tower. And then he'd pull himself up with his hands. I mean, it, this guy was like super massively strong. I mean, it's just to the end. And that's how he got up by pulling how, how up the high tower. Did he, get? he got up to the top. He went to the top. He played his horn. I'm there looking at this going. I'm going to be here when Eddie falls off his tower. And he's like, I'm not going to fall off. He went up there. He played his horn. Pulled himself back down. The same method. He would use the rope to lower his legs and he'd wedge his foot into a piece, you know, corner of the tower. Then he'd pull himself down and do the same thing. It took him like half an hour to get up, 40 minutes and a half an hour to get down. He came down, he came to his walker and he goes, I'm never going up there again. And that was the last time I knew he went up there. It was about a year before he passed away. My great uncle Eddie. Yeah. He's not really my great uncle, he's just a great uncle. And he's an amazing character, and he's made some name for himself here in New York City. Yeah. And uh, all around the world, almost, lots of people know all about his statue. And he was an amazing, fun loving person who had a lot of struggles in his, you know, personally and in his soul. But he um, had a happy, and he made a lot of people happy, and a lot of people smile. And the dinner table was a lot of fun. When Uncle Eddie'd come for Christmas, he didn't come with a little something. He came with great big things when he could. He always, um, he, we all lived on Long Island. He'd come from Manhattan, and on the train, he'd bring us all a little bit of cash. And we were all very happy, and when we were young, he was racing around with us on his back, giving us, we used to call him horseback rides, and uh, a lot of fun. He loves horses. He had a, yes, he was very, um, he was mystified by horses and the way they ran and he loved painting them and he loved everything about them. So. Right across the street here was a school and there was a, there was a flagpole sticking out of, out of the wall. There was nothing on it. So he uh, decided, he says, I want to get a flag on this. So yeah. I went to the teacher, the teacher sent me a principal. The principal said, get out of here. We weren't, he wasn't interested in anything Eddie had to say. So finally, Eddie became so uh, annoying that the police came around. Yeah. They locked him up overnight, and the following day he went before the judge and, and he explained to the judge what he wanted. The judge went along with him 100%, and he walked out of jail, three men. That's the story. And then the American flag went up. And the flag went up, yes. Oh, okay. And you know, you know what I wanted to say? What did you want to say? The last time to the camera. Nice about Eddie. Say, say, say. I'll say something nice about Eddie. Uh -huh. The last time they said something about him, that the, the jerk that was up there that said that he he was an abused child, he was full of shit. <laughs> because he wasn't. No, none, none of us were was abused by no means. We had a very good childhood, an excellent the, childhood. That's what, you know, after everything was over, I wanted to know why you never said that. I never even heard it. I never paid no attention. I heard the guy said that. He's an abused child. You know, like, like we're over here. We could, I could be there and you could be here and hear something and I wouldn't hear it at all. I was sitting next to you on yeah. the bench. Well, maybe your hearing is better than mine. What? Your hearing is either better than mine or worse than mine. I don't know which, which way you want to go. But I'm, I'm his kid brother. I'm the baby. Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine me and him with a couple of young chicks? Absolutely. No, I can't get all <laughs> I'm not talking. Nobody's talking. You don't need it. Crap, okay? Take a walk. You can forget about it. <laughs> we go to Las Vegas. We yeah. buy a limousine or a jet. If oh. they, then we you better wake up. Wait, you ain't coming? You, wake you, up and smell the roses. You ain't coming? <laughs> oh, my kid. You're not taking my phone.
You ain't coming with us. <laughs> no, for a week, for a week we just enjoy ourselves. We do whatever we want, and everything will be on me. And even the, well, not everything. I mean, it's not, I don't mean I'm gonna be on you, but you know what I mean. But I'll pay for everything. We get some young chicks. <laughs> What is you? What are you laughing about? You're not going. No, I'm not going. I'm, right. I'm, I'm, I'm just laughing, laughing at your story. You, you I don't even take uh, middle-aged chicks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he was uh, quite a guy. Was he was abused like I was. Uh, I was abused. He was <laughs> same way. No, we were. We had a very good childhood. Yeah. Very, extremely good childhood. I mean, he was the, he was like the, I was the bad was, one in the I family, I'll tell you the truth. I was the only one that got arrested. He never got arrested. That you know of. Well, I don't, well, I'm sure you didn't. You don't know. And Eddie, but he got arrested a lot of times for nonsense. Yeah. Yeah. But he never did girl. anything bad. He's still sitting about. up there laughing the hell out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Looking down and laughing at us all. You know what you just now said? You're right. He's probably up there saying, look at these jackasses over here. That's right. <laughs> he I'm on top of the world. These jackasses are down here. That's right. That's right. All right. Everybody in your family has a cherry picker? Yeah, me. What do you need? So, so what demolition? You got no one better that could implode it? Yeah, I could blow it up. No, not up. Implode. Implode. You want to implode it? We could burn it too if you want. You know, but you know what I think? Eddie would love it. You know what he would like? All his friends, everybody should take something off it. All of his friends would should take something off it before they destroy it. Yeah. The lumber, no, you know, we sell from firewood. It's best for them to go up and uh, they have the demolition people do it and then take pieces off. But I mean, I wouldn't suggest for any, anybody just to walk I'll up. I'll go up there. You, well, you, you, I can understand you. What, uh, I'm what, what, I'm what, I'm what, Artie, <laughs> you got a Jerry Picker to get me up there? <laughs> Artie's not here, Jeffrey's here. <laughs> I'm Joni Freedom. I'm a garden here, gardener here at the 6th and B Gap Garden, and I'm one of the founders of this garden. Uh, back in 1983, this was an abandoned lot. In 1982, actually, there were buildings on this end of it. They had pulled down the three buildings in the middle where we're sitting now. But there were two buildings on the end that were in terrible disrepair, and they were catching on fire because the junkies in the neighborhood, they would move in and they would... Uh, do whatever they were doing and knock candles over it, it would burn again and then when it's, you know, the firemen would come and put it out, the city would brick it up and they would knock, knock it down again and go back into the holes. Same routine happened over and over and one year they came, the city came, came in here and, demo, and did a demolition on these two buildings. When they cleared out this area, it, was, it wasn't cleared out like cleared ground. There were bath tubs in here and old stoves, there was pipes. There were oil oil tanks that were in the basement from the buildings and whatnot. So a uh, few of us came in here and saw an opportunity. And I, where my garden plot is over there, somebody had been throwing garbage in. And the seeds from the tomatoes and the other vegetables started growing. So when I saw them, having lived in West Virginia and on a farm and uh, being a farmer of sorts, I said, hey, we got to save this. So my roommate and I put a circle around it. David Boyle and I put a, took some of the old bricks from the building and we made a circle around it. And as it uh, developed a little more, David's a Celt, he's a Druid. We did the walkway through it and according to the, you know, the Druidic uh, manner through the sun and the stars and lined everything up. So if you go over and look at the circle and the walkway through it, it's all done by Celtic design. And all the stones, the little seats and benches we have and the slabs of stone, are all from the abandoned buildings that Eddie used to come here and carve before there was a garden. And he lived around the corner on Fifth Street. And he always walked around. Eddie was a character. He never wore shoes. You know, he was, he liked to drink. He was really a, a drinker. And he was a very artistic person. He used to make musical in instruments. He apprenticed with an old man who made musical instruments who taught him how to do this. And so he would do that, and then he would build sculptures. He's, he would take pieces of wood that he found in the street and bring it in here, and he would carve it out of stuff. So as the garden developed, we said, hey, you need to get a plot. Be part of the garden. So he got a plot. And, uh, but he kept bringing in all this wood, and wood, creosote on it, anything. And he would carve everywhere. There would be chipped stuff all over, until we finally said, look it, 
This is a community garden. It is not a sculpture studio. You can do anything you want on your plot. But you can't be bringing creosote. It's poisonous. People are growing vegetables and food, you know, flowers. So if you want to carve, carve on your plot. So he decided to start this little, he was carving, and then it turned into this very small little thing that was about six, seven, eight feet tall. And now it's taller than the buildings next door, the store, which are five stories tall. So it was about 1985 when he started that. And uh, here we are in 2008. He passed away a year ago and at the end of April. Uh, it's kind of a memorial today to his passing a year. And unfortunately, the Parks Department has decided it's unsafe and they want to tear it down. He was the talk of the garden. He kept things lively. And, um, yeah. You either loved him or hated him, and I loved him and, and never hated him, but yeah. boy, he didn't care if you hated him. <laughs> well, no, actually he did. He did. He didn't understand people that, that were filled with hate and uh, made him very confused. Um, and he was a very sensitive guy, even as, as rough and gruff and, and ornery as he, you know, made himself out to be. He was very easily hurt. And... Um, People can be very hurtful. <laughs> they said you can't you can't have things all over the garden. You have to keep it on your plot, Eddie. Yeah. And so he said, Oh yeah. And what can I do on my plot? And they said, Anything you want. Yeah. <laughs> and that was that. <laughs> well, nobody could. They couldn't manage it. <laughs> Anything you want. Oh yeah. <laughs> he was such a good guy, and we all love to hate him. <laughs> so, yeah, Eddie, I remember fondly. I didn't know him that well. I, I met him a few years ago uh, when I became a member, and he uh, he was, you know, quite a spark. You know, he. Uh, he was salt and vinegar and, uh, and, and honey and wine. He's a really strong guy, really skinny as a rail. He's about 6'4", six, 6'5", six, I think. And, and he was really skinny, but uh, I hear this tale that he, uh, he lifted up a, a fire plug that was laying on the side of the road and, and, and brought it over here or something. I was up on, it was on Avenue B. He carried it, he blew everybody's mind, how, his feats of strength. A lot of people didn't like him, but they didn't understand him. They didn't understand that he really, you know, under all that uh, salt and vinegar, he, he really had a sweetness to him. I mean, he was a mama's boy, for God's sakes, you know. He, he really was. His mom died and he wore his pearls, her pearls, to remind him of her, you know. What, a what, lot of people coveted those pearls. Yeah, and a lot of... They were uh, decent pearls. What a great tribute to wear your mother's pearls and not worry about if people thought he was gay or a sissy or whatever, you know. He was very artistic, but he would never call himself an artist. And what do you I, think he'd call himself? Pain in the ass. A drunk, uh, a pain <laughs> in the ass. Uh, uh, I don't know, the only time he ever left this neighborhood was when he was in the service. He was in the Navy for a while. So he's very provincial. There's millions of people around here. Not that many people are really that creative. You know, they want to be. You know. And some are, and they've got huge egos because of it. He's just a plain guy, and that's what he wanted to be thought of, I think. Nothing special, a really, really earthy guy. That, you know, I don't not. think he built it as a tower to himself. I don't, I don't think, think it, so it either. It was an ego thing. I don't think so either. He, he, just, built, it, he built it because something he to wanted do. to build it. It yeah. took up time, but was, he had a lot of. Yeah. And it's, I think other people turned it into this icon. Something you to know, do, yeah. But he made a tombstone oh, for himself. What was the date on that? Well, he didn't have any. No date. Yeah, he planned on living longer than the cockroaches. It wasn't psychic. I'm, I'm sticking oh, around yeah. just to bug the hell out of everybody. Come here. So you know some Eddie stories? He wants Eddie stories. We had some real down, dragged out arguments in this regard. But over the years, Eddie started mellowing out and getting, you know, he would only get really honest with people if he was south, which is most of the time. Um, but over the years he started mellowing and the kids 
my kids grew up in this garden. They were little, I mean young. And I remember Eddie always yelling at all the kids, don't do this, don't do that. But over the years, he, he uh, took and mellowed out to, to a point to where he'd be sitting at the gate We could leave our kids in here and go off shopping or whatever huh. and come back a couple hours later. Nobody would go near those kids. Eddie was like a mother hen. My daughter, she stayed it when she heard that the tower's coming down. I'll go down there and chain my ass to it. <laughs> they ain't gonna take it down. <laughs> he was a fixture like this yeah, yeah. and they, they grew up around around that the Japanese mayor offered Eddie fifty thousand dollars for the tower really they would come over with engineers and mark everything and take take and disassemble it and assemble it over there. And he said, $50,000 wouldn't make me turn over my bed. This is part of New York City. This is part of the garden. He wouldn't have sold that for any price. He named it my baby. And he wasn't going to let it out of his sight. For him, it was always the garden was always open, yeah. and it was really for him that policy was always like a reflection on him. He would be at the gate and invite people in. He was uh, he was like the host, yeah. the host for the garden. Um, at one point, I I got um, a dulcimer, uh, Mount yeah. dulcimer. And the way that I could secure it was to um, tie it around my neck. Yeah. And I found some twine and tied it on one end, tied it on the other end, and left room for my head and my neck. And he saw me with that and he said, no, that's no good. He said, you're an artist. The way you have this, it looks like junk. You have to, it's got to be beautiful. You can't have it like this. So I felt very badly about it, and I went home, and I found some beautiful gold uh, ribbon that was long enough, and I redid the whole the thing. And but I keep in my mind that yeah. you know I'm an artist, so I have to present in a in a, a more um, artistic or beautiful uh, aesthetic kind of a way. He used to tell me, oh, I love to hear you sing. He used to tell me that a lot. Yeah. And then years later, why can't you sing regular songs? Like regular songs, like a regular person. Why do you have to sing the way? He <laughs> <laughs> involved all people. <laughs> well, you know, he, he wanted what he wanted to hear. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> are slow and drain your heavy heart to bars don't think you'll lose the stain on mountain action wards the service of the main Okay, you want to say burn it once more?
like Eddie would say it? Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. Okay, I think you channeled the spirit. I think I channeled the spirit. <laughs>